Thanks very much, Brian. Um, that was a very comprehensive introduction. But I do want to give um, a bit more insight into what I do and who I am. So I'm a fund manager. Now, when I say that, most people look a bit confused. Yeah? Not because they don't know what a fund manager does, because it generally does not come packaged like this. Bear with me. So if I say Warren Buffett, some of you might even know Ray Dalio, maybe Mark Mobius, what about famous hedge fund managers, George Soros, um, Bill Ackerman. If you've recognized any of them, you probably already have a picture in your head of what a fund manager uh, does and what they look like. This is not it. So can you just hold that thought for a little bit? Um, so when we get to talking about the socio part of socioeconomic environment, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that up again. Now, I know you all think or you, you'll feel like you're being set up, yeah? You are. <laughs> Bear with me. So for me, today is a fun day out. Um, I get to address a very educated crowd of people. Um, we get to talk about my favorite topic, the stock market and the economy. Um, and you guys have paid really good money for this. Um, so I, I must just tell you that uh, my family, my friends, my staff are all sitting at home or at the office having a good giggle about this, right? They're like, oh my goodness, this one, we can't shut her up. And people are actually wanting to hear her talk. So thank you very much. <laughs> So under normal circumstances, I spend my day reading re research, checking the stock markets, building Excel models, catching up on news, more importantly, deciding how to invest people's hard earned money. Should I invest or how should I invest? I should say, should I buy Amazon shares? Um, should I buy Steinoff? They've fallen so much. Or shall I wait for that Yersto Fellows court case to come up? Um, yeah, there's so many questions I need to ask, you know, is Naspers cheap? Is Christo Visser going to revive PEPCO? Then the other side, should I invest in South African government bonds? How about I buy some ESCOM bonds? Uh, the question, of course, is are they going to run out of money and default so that maybe that yield that they're offering won't really compensate me for the risk I'm taking? So to state the obvious, I do not have a crystal ball. So I cannot see the future. But what I do know, and so eloquently put by Benjamin Graham, who is considered, by the way, to be the father of value investing, so another fund manager, um, he said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So he's a fund manager like me. You can see the similarities, right? So let's quickly have a look at where we are at the stock market today. And this is quite a difficult graph, I think, for a few people. Um, I, I'm just checking that you can see it. But if you can't, don't worry, I'll go, I'll go through it very quickly. So in the 90s, first we had the Asian contagion. Then we had the Russian debt default crisis. Stock market fell a little bit and then rebounded until about 2000, about 1999, 2000, 2001, what was the dot-com era suddenly became the dot-bomb era, and it blew up, right? That little blow up, or I can basically call it a crash in the stock market, meant the stock market fell 37%. So if you had had invest, money invested in the stock market in 2000, or 1999, let's say, by the end of 2001, you would have had 37% less money in your portfolio. Then we see the market rally. Now, this is the interesting one, because from here, the market rallies 150%, 156%, my apologies. Um, and if you've ever been to England uh, and you speak to the Brits on a Friday evening and they're discussing um, whether or not each of them have bought their lottery tickets and kind of when you, like as a, a statistician or a mathematician, you explain to them that the odds of winning the lottery are, bet, are, are worse than being struck by lightning. Their retort generally to that is, well, you've got to be in it to win it. <laughs> so, so I think my point here is if you had fallen for the dot-com bubble burst and your shares had fallen 37%, and you decided to take your money out of the stock market, you would have missed out on that 156% rally. 
Don't worry, I'm getting, this is going somewhere, I promise. <laughs> so eight years later, I was working at Morgan Stanley in London, and I found myself standing on the trading floor in Canary Wharf, looking out of the window in absolute dread, because we were watching the Lehman Brothers employees carry their boxes out of the office. The global financial crisis was spectacular, to say the least. And if you invite me for tea one day, I'll share my war stories about how we sold Russian volatility at 60 and it went to 120, so basically we lost 100%. But what followed that was a very steady upward trajectory until the dreaded coronavirus fears took the world by storm. And so that's the second last arrow in the big red circle you can see. Spoiled my birthday in March of 2020, the market fell 30% in days. So let's just say I pay my hairdresser a lot of money to hide the gray that caused. So as I mentioned previously, if you have a share portfolio, you're probably worried about how it's fallen between 10, 20% in the last couple of months. My summation from this slide, sit tight, don't crystallize your losses, the market always recovers. But I must tell you, the market is simply an indicator of what is happening on the ground. So let's have a quick look at where we are on the ground in the economy. So you'll forgive me for the heading of this slide, but it is one of my favorites. The phrase, it's the economy, stupid, was coined by a guy called James Carville in 1992. He was Bill Clinton's strategist for when Bill got elected as president, he beat uh, George H. Bush, right? George W. Bush. He, bought, he beat the bush. And Carville used to use this phrase as part of a very winning campaign. The other two main messages were change versus more of the same. They're very clever politicians, huh? And then the other one was don't forget healthcare. So as I say, politicians. So what does our economy look like now? Oh, sorry, got to go back there. So first of all, inflation. It is the word on everyone's lips at the moment. Secondly, our GDP growth is 1.9% in the last quarter of this year. Unemployment, 34.5%, an expanded definition of 45.5%, and here's the really scary number, youth unemployment at 64%. So this, so, so this youth unemployment number is the one that really worries me. Um, it, it, it's just, it's incredible to think about it. And it also reminds me of something my grandmother used to say, the devil finds work for idle hands. And if you indulge me for a minute, I have to tell you a little story. So as Brian mentioned, I lived in Tunisia for two and a half years from 2010. And if you recall in January of 2011, they had a revolution, which was pretty much accredited for being the catalyst that became the Arab Spring. And the reason I tell the story is because the characteristic of the socioeconomic environment is so very similar, in my view, to the South African environment at the moment. What happened in early January was that a female cop approached um, a fruit seller in the south of Tunisia. He didn't have a license to be selling his fruit. The police tipped over his fruit cart, leaving him with no way to make a living or to feed his family. Out of sheer desperation, the Tunisian fruit seller self-immolated. The man set himself alight. Now, I cannot imagine how desperate you must be to have to set yourself alight. Many of the Tunisian population were already pretty much unhappy with the government at that stage. Um, unemployment was high. The economy was struggling. Uh, the president and his family were living a very comfortable life in their palaces, the winter palace, the summer palace, there were so many of them. Um, and it was the, really the young people of Tunisia who protested. They kick-started the revolution, basically forcing this president out. And I think it's still there today, but in the main square of the government buildings in Tunis, there is a graffiti that says, thank you, Facebook, because that's how the youth organized the revolution and kicked out the president. And of course, the story goes on, but what my gran used to say about devil and idle hands makes sense, right? The, their youth unemployment was huge. These guys were sitting on the street corner, 
not knowing what to do, out of desperation. Do you know that half our population lives on social grants? Now, you can agree or disagree with me on this, but I think there is no dignity on living on a social grant. We need to create jobs. This is, this is a fairly old slide, a couple of years old, and it comes from the uh, Monday morning newsletter that says from the desk of the president, if anyone gets it, or should I say gets a chance to read it. And he makes a valid point. It's time to move from a relief economy to a recovery economy. In fact, I think that might have been before lockdown, so maybe we give him two years grace period. So I want to talk a little bit about stagflation. So some people will disagree with me, quite disagreeable, I, I can tell you. Um, but I believe we are now firmly entrenched in what is called a stagflationary environment. This means we have low growth, high unemployment, and high inflation. Those three things are incredibly difficult to manage from an eco economic point of view. Normally, one would raise interest rates to contain inflation. So if you've got high inflation, you raise interest rates, people stop spending money, and the inflation should fall down because it's the demand supply and the less demand, you'll be good, right? However, in this situation, us, you, me, the consumer, is already under so much pressure that asking them to pay more for their mortgages, their car loans, other debt, is a horrid situation. It's a terrible burden. But then at the same time, Inflation is a terrible, a terrible thing, and especially for us in the emerging economy. And if any of you have seen what happened in Zimbabwe or can remember the hyperinflation that was caused, you understand what I mean. But let me show you why inflation is so bad. I, I randomly picked a couple of things and put it in my shopping basket. I tried to cover everybody. I'm not sure I've got it right, but let's just go with, go with this for a while, right? If in 2012 you had bought 50 liters of petrol, two and a half kilograms of maize meal, 24 cans of beer, sounds like a song, 750 grams of coffee, six cans of Coke, and a packet of crisps, it would have cost you 285 rand and 73 cents. If on Tuesday, you had gone to the shops and bought the exact same thing 10 years later, it would have cost you 1,653 rand and 95 cents. I, I have to ask, has your salary increased by 10 times in the last 10 years? I, I actually just think I don't have to say anything more about that slide. The point is probably taken. And, and before I move on, let me show you something else. Can you believe that in 1975, South Africa was the largest gold producer in the world? We produced 42% of the world's gold. Today, we pro no, actually not today, because we don't know today's numbers, but in 2021, we produced 4.2% of the world's gold. I mean, we're not even in the top six anymore. Now, I, I don't, don't get me wrong here, I don't want to advocate going back to being an, a mining economy and for all the money in the world, I do not want to be Neil Froneman. Mr. I got paid 300 million rand and my workers are striking because I'm not paying them enough. <laughs> don't want that job. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that if we're going to lose one sector of the economy, we really need to replace it with something else because those are probably millions of jobs over 25, 20, 47 years that we have lost out in one sector of the economy. And I think we need to do it really quickly. Let's talk a bit about the socio part of socioeconomic environment. So a socio, the study of behaviors of people. And I'm going to show you a video and I'm going to be watching you while you watch this video because I know, I will see from your faces if you've got the riddle. For the human mind, we asked 22 people to solve the same riddle and recorded their responses. Feel free to participate also. Are you ready? Um... 
The Riddle. A father is about to bring his son to a job interview, applying for a position at a large stockbroker's company in the city. Just as they arrive at the company's parking lot, the son's phone rings. He looks at his father who says, go ahead, answer it. The caller is the trading company CEO who says, good luck son, you've got this. The son ends the call and once again looks at his father, who is still next to him in their car. How is this possible? <laughs> he gets a call from the CEO, uh, but it says... Good luck, son. But he was next to him. So it's not the father. I think it was probably an audio recording of his father. Maybe he made an... Uh... A demo tape? Like, is like he has two fathers? This is a hot one. Maybe it's a word joke, like it's the grandfather of the son. No, I think his name is Son. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just like an old man, you know, calling a younger guy Son. I have no idea. The answer. It's his mother. Ah! Oh, that's oh, that's so stupid. Yes, of course. Ah, ah. I should have thought of that. Yes. The CEO is a woman. So I'm I'm biased. <laughs> in a sense, is this about diversity and inclusion? It's really mind blowing, actually. I always thought that uh, I'm not as not very sexist. But in spite of that, I think these subconscious biases are there in everyone's mind. How much bias I still have in terms of thinking that the CEO needs to be a man. Yeah, I definitely was picturing a man. They identify with males more than females these days. Why can't women also be CEOs or doctors or, right? When I think about a CEO or, so, or someone that's high positioned within a company, I mostly think of men. And it's a shame, I think. And it's so weird, because I'm a CEO, and I'm a woman. And I want to be a CEO. Why didn't I think about that? Crap. I believe uh, women can absolutely be CEOs, and that's definitely something that we should work on, especially when you're saying that so many people have been told this riddle, and most people haven't gotten it. Women make great CEOs and great leaders as well. And yet only 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Let's change our mindset. Oh, don't clap so quickly. <laughs> I'm going to add to your anxiety. I'm going to throw this into today's equation. So um, this is probably where I need, if there are any journalists in the room, put down your pen, because I know you're going to misquote me. <laughs> OK. So, oof, I'm a bit nervous, but let's just go with it. So, of course, it's crossed my mind. Is BEE reverse racism? Is it, who is it really helping? And for me, the most important of all, why are my peers asset managers, and yet I am a black female asset manager? So I'm sure a couple of you in the room have read the outgoing COO of Facebook, sorry, now Meta, um, her book called Lean In. And in her book, Sheryl Sandberg quotes Gloria Steinem, who is considered probably to be one of the first feminists in the history of feminism. And Gloria Steinem says, whoever has the power takes over the noun and the norm, while the less powerful get an adjective. So I'm going to ask you again. Why am I considered a black female asset manager and my white male peers are simply asset managers? So I'm not one of the 476,000 people in this country advocating for getting rid of BEE. Um, I do believe if you cannot see it, you cannot be it. Let me explain it a little bit. <laughs> I, I just need to make this point. So I, I do believe that we need to use BEE to get our foot in the door. But 
Once we are there, it really is up to us to prove that we are better than anyone else, that we deserve this job. No one can ignore hard work, and you don't need a label. So I really urge everyone here today to start thinking about building an economy based on meritocracy. I've already been quoted uh, as a throw forward to this conference um, as saying that politicians need to get out of the way because it is up to each of us as South Africans to get back to being a society of givers and not a society of takers. Okay, journalists, you can pick up your pens now. I'm done. <laughs> so I've still got a few minutes, but um, I really am pretty much done. I think my message should be fairly clear, but I want to leave you with two more points of wisdom. First of all, ego is the enemy of leadership and negative people never build anything. Thank you very much. <laughs>